Good morning, afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm still in a morning session. I apologize for that. Good afternoon. Uh, the question is, uh, first of all, I'm Mike Sprague. I'm the director of the Polar Institute and director of the Global Risk and Resilience Program at the Wilson Center. Uh, but I guess the most important question I have received since I walked into the room is, is it too cold or is it too warm? Now, as an Alaskan, I can tell you it's never cold enough. But if you feel too cold or too warm, you can at least you can let us know and we will adjust the temperature. That was the most pressing issue coming through the door. Okay. So all who feel comfortable. All right. Many Alaskans. Excellent. Those who feel uncomfortable. One, one Alaskan in the back of the room. Thank you very much. That's why they make flights to Hawaii. We know what the schedule is. I want to thank you all for coming this afternoon. We had a morning session of um, experts on this particular issue, which we'll talk a little bit more about for the next uh, hour and a half or so, two hours. Uh, but it was a really engaged discussion about sort of the United States assets and how we prepare for the future using assets that we'll talk about in a moment, but also how we fund these national assets to enhance not just Arctic research and research in general, but really in the national interest. What kind of facilities does the U.S. have in stock and how do we use them uh, over the horizon, literally and, and figuratively? So we're here to talk about uh, the High Altitude, high Frequency Active Aurora Research Program, or HARP. And HARP, you have the narrative, but there is a mirror, no pun intended, a mirror of HARP uh, at Arecibo in Puerto Rico. So two of four Na international facilities that work in the ionosphere are in the United States. These two of four facilities are world-class facilities. These two of four facilities uh, function like other nations' facilities and or aspirational nations' facilities. So we know that other countries are either building or has, have aspirations for similar facilities. What does that mean for the United States? But more importantly, what does it mean for the longevity of the facilities we currently have in Alaska and Puerto Rico? And so this morning's discussion uh, with experts really went through not just what the work is, and you'll see that, but also about long-term funding sustainable into the future. Uh, as noted uh, in some other discussions, maybe the United States and other countries have a propensity for building capacity, and then when that single capacity no longer is needed, we seem to turn the lights out but then realize maybe a decade or two later that actually that facility that we used to have, we simply need again and we rebuild or reorganize. So we have these two wonderful national assets and what their future looks like should be of interest to all of us. So that's what this afternoon's program will be. Uh, in order to give us some background perspective and to introduce the first speaker, I'd like to uh, invite to the podium Dr. Bob McCoy. He is the director of the Geophysical Institute and the uh, HARP facility reports up through the Geophysical Institute. Bob? Again, I'd like to uh, echo Mike's comments, uh, welcoming all of you to, to come here and, and thanking you for showing up. Um, it's, it's a strange discussion we'll have this afternoon. A lot of people don't understand what active ionospheric experiment facilities are. Um, they're, they're radios, they're transmitters, uh, they're ham radios, they're very powerful, in, in the case of HARP, the most powerful ham radio in, in the world. And what you can do with it, a, a variety of things, and you're going to hear about it from our, our speakers, but you can use these to, to transmit communications. You can use them to heat the ionosphere. You can take the ionosphere overhead and turn it into a laboratory. You can reach out and touch it and do things. You can create experiments, and, and uh, I heard this morning a discussion of like plucking a guitar string and, and watching what it, what it does. So we have a series of four talks. Uh, we'll, we'll hear applications for uh, active ionospheric experiments for the Navy, not in this order, the Air Force, the Navy, the Department of Energy, and then a general science discussion from a professor from Cornell. So uh, just a little bit of background. The Department of Defense built the uh, High Frequency Active Aurora Research Program to study a variety of things. And then and, uh, three or four years ago decided they didn't want it anymore. Uh, the University of Alaska stepped in and said, we'll take it. Not, not me, but my, my bosses. We, we took ownership. It took us a while to get it back operational, and, and now it's, it's up and running. It's the most powerful in the world, and we're carrying out campaigns. We've carried out six campaigns, and a lot of scientists are coming to use it. But a university, as a university, we're struggling to keep it, to keep it going. Uh, the science is, the, the facility's exquisite. It's the most powerful. 
a lot of opportunities, um, but it's just a little difficult for a university to, to, to sustain a facility like that. Now, what we heard this morning, there's a lot of, a lot of changes on the strategic scene. Um, and so these facilities have applications beyond science, beyond just studying the upper atmosphere and the ionosphere. They may have other facilities, other capabilities like communication, global communication, like over the horizon radar, like uh, understanding ionospheric effects on, on, uh, on signals. So with that, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ha hand the microphone off to our first pair of speakers are from the Air Force Research Lab. Dr. Evgeny Mission and Jason Williams will be up here. Uh, Evgeny is from Kirtland Air Force Base, uh, Space Vehicles Directorate, and Jason is from Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. And the two of them are gonna talk about Air Force applications of, of uh, active ionospheric experiments. Well, thanks for inviting. It's not about maybe applications, but it's more about science. But this science helps to create some useful things using such a tremendous facility, unique facility as HARP for applications. So now about phys some uh, particular uh, physics which helps to understand uh, plasma disturbances natural in natural geospace basically in the ionosphere all right how to move it this way or that way all right so first of all, I would like to uh, briefly outline. Oh, okay, perfect. That's maybe this way. Thank you. Outline uh, recent discoveries at HARP, such as descending artificial ionization la layers. So it's a uh, artificial plasma produced during this high power HF heating. Then a specific mechanism which was developed to explain these observations. And um, more subtle mechanism, how uh, day experiments during daytime differs from uh, that done in the nighttime. Basically, the ac acceleration mechanism of thermal electrons, bulk electrons, or photoelectrons during daytime. And that will be compared to natural aurora, or polar borealis, if you want. So it's nice examples of such very <laughs> spectacular aurora display. And the mechanism which explains uh, different colors, different you know, altitudinal profiles in aurora, and it's very important, uh, not only for, you know, just to know what exact mechanism works, what the physics, underlying under physics, but also for um, diagnostics of the energy released in the auroral ionosphere during such uh, strong auroral displays. All right, that's example, that's basically, uh, uh, example of the first observations, first direct identification of uh, HARP produced or HF produced plasma. Here, uh, just briefly, okay, is there a pointer? I think, no. Okay, that's no pointer. <laughs> oh, where is it? Okay, all right, here are images from uh, these two uh, at HARP looking along the magnetic field line, now upward, up B, in the uh, green line, 5577 angstroms, and uh, blue line. It's actually what, what is seen when you look at it by naked eyes. And this is from remote imager so that you can see 
how this uh, cl cloud of the gr green line aurora, and then it descends this time, and this is the altitude. So because a blue, a green and blue line at HARP, they develop coherently, it means that you have <coughs> ionization uh, because the blue line indicates ionization of very energetic electrons, suprathermal electrons. And so that ionization region moves uh, down the, downward or descends this time. So the artificial plasma is produced and moving downward. All right, and that's what is shown here. You can see uh, uh, f uh, this image from, uh, from uh, uh, remote imager done during, uh, during, this, uh, during this time frame. And also uh, digizond or ionizond, which at HARP, which measures really density distribution, plasma density distribution, shows that indeed you have descending layer right at this time, right from here. And basically you have two layers, one at the bottom side, another uh, uh, at, at much lower altitude, like sh shown here. You have this uh, bright spot here, which corresponds to this layer, and the uh, bottom side layer right here. So uh, uh, the question is: the question is, what mechanism produces such op, 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 such energetic electrons, like? more than uh, tens EV electrons, which actually ionize neutrals and produce artificial plasma. And the mechanism is very sim uh, relatively simple. OK, that's uh, how uh, a radio wave propagates, depending on the injection angle. Injection angle, say, northward or southward from HARP facility. You can see this red line red layer here or here. That's where uh, the most energy, <coughs> uh, where the um, plasma resonance, where the uh, heating uh, transmitter frequency matches local plasma frequency, or about the plasma frequency. So that's where the uh, electromagnetic waves converses into electrostatic waves due to various mechanisms. And this electrostatic waves or plasma turbulence creates energetic electrons by some acceleration mechanisms. So we focus here on, on a strong Langmuir turbulence, some particular mechanism which operates near the plasma resonance, near here and, and here, different injection angles. All right. So uh, the mechanism, the basic mechanism is for production such artificial plasma is that oh, mm, so is that plasma waves generated near, length, near the plasma resonance produces or accelerates uh, uh, suprathermal electrons in some energy range. And it's very uh, flat spectrum, so that this spectral index is about of one. So a lot of suprathermal electrons is generated uh, with neutrals and produces new plasma. And so this, uh, it means that you have plasma resonance at each time step uh, well below the initial plasma resonance, because uh, and radio waves propagate and interacts each time with a new layer, so that you have like an ionizing wave front moving downward. And uh, to do that, you just need not much suprathermal electrons, like a tiny part of, of the, of the um, background plasma. So that 
it matches well not only uh, the sense speed which can be determined from the from the from the data but also uh, intensities of artificial aurora in both green and and blue line uh, wavelengths okay so uh, numerical modeling done by uh, Bengt Ellis and, and uh, Dennis Papadopoulos and others shows how this accelerated tail appears during uh, real uh, harp uh, parameters. And it's very nicely uh, matches what theory and uh, numerical experiments and laboratory measurements done back in the 80s and 70s. Anyway, and uh, the modeling shows nicely how this uh, uh, the descending layers appear and propagate uh, in time after switch on. All right, so uh, daytime versus nighttime. That's, uh, there are uh, several uh, features of the descending layers were established, but most important for, for this talk is that production of the of this uh, descending layers is facilitated in the sunlit or day si uh, daytime ionosphere. So uh, basically all these features established from the HARP and also a receiver experiment done by Paul Bernhardt. All right, so uh, what we've noticed that more efficient ionization or acceleration uh, exists when photoelectrons are present. And that makes, uh, that's explained theoretically and um, numerically uh, recently by, again, Bengt and, uh, and Dennis uh, to explain uh, recent experiments at Arecibo actually done by Paul Berthold and published recently. So the, the, uh, the physics here is very simple in terms of strong Langmuir turbulence. So that uh, I won't dwell on that, just show and move on. So indeed, theory and, and, and numerical modeling shows that much more energetic electrons are accelerated during daytime when uh, photoelectrons are present or background suprathermal electrons are present. Okay, now we have a uh, direct link to aurora. The classical aurora, probably you all know, that's a classical uh, profile of altitudinal profile of a brightness and actually also ionization done by when precipitating energetic or primary electrons penetrate into, into, uh, into the upper atmosphere. So you have basically monotonic profile with some maximum, well-defined maximum, which is defined only by electron beam energy and, of course, neutral density. And it's used widely for oral diagnostics, as I said. And so the second signature of this classical aurora is the spectrum of secondary electrons which, which are produced by primary electrons, penetrating electrons. And it's very steep. So basically, it's a spectral index is about three, four. All right, next, artificial and natural aurora. So that the example of artificial aurora produced by electron beams injected from, from a rocket. So that you have a, like a hundred of, of these electron pulses, electron beams, and each creates uh, auroral rays. So that near rocket glow and uh, in the E region, oh, in, you have this auroral ray, which is in fact not this monotonic classical aurora, but it has two maxima, two humps. And the same is observed in natural aurora. It's called enhanced by some reason. You see the profiles are almost identical. So the same mechanism works and explains both. Oh. Uh -huh. 
All right. And um, radar uh, incoherent scatter observation shows exactly the same profiles in the uh, density and, 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 and temperature, actually. So the mechanism is strong Langmuir turbulence excited in Aurora. And if the, it works in, in a way that you have maximum of the uh, plasma waves, Langmuir waves excited by, by the beam, which has a bump somewhere, call, we called it plasma turbulence layer back in the 80s. And uh, so that ionization and um, acceleration of, of this turbulence, by this turbulence of, uh, second, uh, of uh, plasma electrons create ionization bump in this plasma turbulence layer. So combining collisional and uh, turbulent, you have characteristic two hump, uh, two bumps, two peaks, uh, aurora profile. So, uh, well, and um, we have, uh, of course, observations of suprasormal electrons during natural and, and, and artificial aurora experiments. And they all show this flat, very flat spectra typical of strong turbulence. But what is important, we cannot explain, we could not explain, at least numerically or quantitatively, such kind of observations in, the, in, in Aurora, which are typical uh, and uh, basically what, what you expect for, for this enhanced Aurora. So that you have typical secondary spectrum and then all of a sudden it switched to this kind of flat spectrum. And that's exactly <coughs> acceleration of secondary electrons. Very much the same as acceleration of photoelectrons in the, uh, during descending layers uh, events. So that I think I stop here, and uh, that's basically a summary. That HARP significantly advanced our understanding of electron acceleration in, in natural aurora, and much more can be done with uh, if you do experiments with improved diagnostic at HARP. Oh, thanks. <laughs> not sure whether I was on time or not. Nobody stopped. Uh -huh. Any questions? Thank you. Next up is Jason Williams from Air Force Research Lab in Wright-Patterson, Air Force Base, Ohio. That's correct. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, like you mentioned, I'm Jason Williams. I come from the, uh, the sensors director at Wright-Patterson. I work in the uh, multi-central, multi-spectral sensing and detecting division in the RF branch. Um, while she's bringing that up, uh, um, I will uh, I'll come out and say I have no equations in my briefing, so maybe this will... For some of you who don't like equations, this might be a little bit easier briefing to, to handle. Um, yeah, she's getting it there. So I initially sent a briefing that was a wrong distribution statement, so I couldn't use it. So in a scramble, we got some, uh, uh, some briefing slides with the right distribution statement on them. So I got five or six slides, nothing special. The whole goal is to just to let you understand how we, how we can use uh, HARP and Arecibo in the future. Ah, there we go. All right, very good. This is easy enough. Thank you. I guess the button that's worn off is the one I should be pressing, right? Okay, so um, this is titled the Sensors Director Review. It's really been cut down. It's really the our, our division will review the um, multi. Hold on, what do we got here? All right, one slide. Okay, so. So FRL, um, like I said, we're, we're from Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, Ohio. We work with lots of different communities uh, throughout um, the Air Force Research Lab. 
throughout the government. You know, we try to collaborate as much as possible. It's part of our charter. Um, our goal is really to explore EO, IR, and RF uh, sensing options that are out there. Uh, since you are the sensors directorate, um, really looking at aerospace sensing and any spectrum warfare technologies that we can take advantage of. Our mission really is to sense, detect, ID, precisely track and engage any threats and any targets of interest. Um, this is where HARP and Arecibo come in. They can help us, I think, um, in, in future research to use these facilities to do just that. Uh, one thing that we try to do is foster collaborative research to discover and exploit, um, help us transition technologies that are critical to our warfighter. So, like I said, we do work with the FFRDCs and universities and other government agencies, um, industry, and anybody else who's willing to, uh, to collaborate with us so we can get uh, some research completed here. Um, some of our core technical competencies, that's how our, our funding is set up. It's set up by the core technical competency. Uh, we're focused on the first two um, in our division, the RF sensing and the EO sensing uh, portion. Uh, we do both of these. Our branch primarily focuses on, on RF sensing. We do antenna development and, and just uh, electromagnetic studies in general. Uh, but another, some other branches in our division work on the EO um, aspect of, of research. And these are uh, the other boxes are just some other, uh, other divisions in our directorate um, uh, doing work. Okay, so basically this is what we do in our division. So we look at this uh, long-range RF sensing, and we do a lot of uh, OTHR in our RF technologies branch. They do so OTHR work, uh, how to, you know, improve resolution, how to increase distance, how to look at targets, uh, target tracking, things like that. And with the new hypersonic threats, they're interested in, you know, potentially uh, how, do you, how do you track a hypersonic vehicle, um, how do you track any other um, inbound threats that are coming in? So we can use long-range sensing. We can use distributed RF, which is uh, kind of the way to go when we're looking at, at some of the new threats on, on the horizon. Because of the way the Cape Blues are, we have longer standoff now. So we're going to have to use um, smaller, lower-valued assets to be able to, to engage an enemy. Um, so distributed RF sensing is critical. So it's, it's from space, it's from air platforms, it's from potentially from the ground. So lots of things are going to uh, have to work together in order to be successful. Um, our branch is there at the, uh, one of our functions in our branch is there at the bottom, the RF sensing concept ex explorations, uh, 6-2 kind of work. We do a lot of different kinds of research. Uh, we do have some AFOSR 6-1 tasks that we look at. Uh, we look at uh, electromagnetic uh, scattering, bi-statics and multi-static trying to look at clutter mitigation, look at plasma uh, research for RF communication, uh, potentially for hypersonic use, we look at atmospheric modification uh, for multiple applications. We also have a multifunction RF sensing group that looking at trying to reduce the size, weight, and cost of some of these components so we can have one, maybe a common aperture that does multiple, uh, multiple functions just to keep the cost down. Um, and then all this passive RF sensing that we do. So uh, someone mentioned earlier about possibly uh, this morning briefing, possibly modifying HARP or Arecibo to do different functionality. If, uh, if Arecibo could, you know, become another OTHR type of facility, its location would be critical. Um, we could modify, I know Dr. Bernhardt mentioned uh, modifying the beam possibly at Arecibo uh, by adding different an an antenna components. We could use use those type of modifications on those current facilities to help us do some research. So lots of different ways we could, we could work together with these two um, organizations to, to help us meet our needs. We just got to find a way to, to get there. Um, some of our, our, our core uh, challenges, passive RF sensing in, uh, in these contested environments, all that's going to happen in any, any engagement that we get into. Electronic warfare is going to come up. They're going to they're going to fill the sky with all different kinds of radiation. We're going to have to have to be able to to sort through that. Uh, the the bi-static and multi-static uh, sensing is very important. Our group really focuses, like I said, on on bi-static phenomenology and how we um, how we can reduce the noise to be able to identify a target. Um, and then really looking at low uh, C swap size, weight, and power cost size, weight, and power for some RF components, so we can. Um, change the way that we do some of the, the warfare activities that we do right now. And I think that's all I have. 
Um, if there's anything else I have, just some quick notes, but I think that's really it. So uh, uh, hopefully we can uh, continue to work with TARP and Arecibo. Hopefully we can find a way to keep them open and, uh, and do some research in the future. So thank you. Next up is the Navy. Uh, Dr. Paul Bernhardt from the Naval Research Lab, the Space Plasma, the Plasma Physics Division, will come up and talk about Navy research and applications with uh, active ionospheric experiments. So my first question is, does anybody know what green wings look like? Then it's always fair to know no, no green wings look like. Okay, because I have a marvelous demonstration of really one scattering with a green laser pointer. Yeah, I already, I already asked your crack staff back there. Okay, okay, a little bit later we can uh, do a demo. So, I have an, I have another question. Is Amanda in the office? In the, excellent. So, I had heard about your marvelous experiments up at HARP, and I wanted to relate to you that we actually have made sound with HARP, but we didn't broadcast sound. The plasma made the sound really cool, and I'm going to play it for you, so nobody's going to leave, I know. Okay. <laughs> what we do is we send up a monochromatic electromagnetic wave and hit the ionosphere at... Uh, I don't have a laser pointer, but you would need that microphone. Okay. That would be perfect. All right. We do not have the green okay, that's fine. So we hit the ionosphere with a monochromatic signal, only one frequency, at say 10 megahertz or four megahertz, whatever it is. And the power is so large that it excites other waves in the plasma. Now what kind of waves could be in a plasma? Well, you got electrons and you have magnetic fields, so maybe the electrons go around the magnetic field. That's called the gyro frequency. Or maybe you take an electron and you displace it from its equilibrium and it oscillates back and forth. It's called the plasma frequency. Of course you have ions, so you also have the ion plasma frequency and the ion cyclotron frequency, which is 50 hertz, by the way. But then the ions and the electrons can work together and you get things called hybrid frequencies. You get lower hybrid frequencies, which are around eight kilohertz, and upper hybrid frequencies are sort of like the plasma frequency, uh, the geometric mean of the plasma frequency and, and the uh, ion electron cyclotron frequency. Then there's all called kind of weird frequencies called Bernstein modes, which are near, oh, is that green? Yeah. Yes. Okay, so I talked long enough that I finally got my green laser pointing because <laughs> they realize that I will not leave. Okay, so, and nobody can hear me, but that's, that's because I need to go over to this, this sign right here. Okay. So this laser is operating at one wavelength, and oh, I'm in trouble. <laughs> I have to talk and, and chew gum at the same time. Okay, now if I t flash this here, you see indeed it is green. If I go here, I go here, I go on the red of the flag, I, everywhere I point this, this thing is green. But if you look very carefully, if I point this here, does anybody see any yellow in that? Mm -hmm. Yes. So what's happening is we're taking green light, it is exciting the red that's combining with the green, and you're getting yellow. So that's exactly what we're going to do with the high-power radio waves. We're going to hit one frequency. It's going to excite other frequencies. And then back coming at us will be the original frequency plus another frequency. And that's called parametric decay. It's also called Brillo on scatter, but nobody can pronounce that. Parametric <laughs> decay. <laughs> and that's the only reason I need a green laser. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> so what we're doing now is plasma wave generation and sounds of harp. So we take a high power transmitter that's composed of a 12 by 15 array. We make a nice narrow beam of 
radio waves, it hits the ionosphere. Once it hits the ionosphere, guess what happens? It launches waves coming back. So it excites the plasma that re-radiates at your pump frequency plus some other things called stimulated electromagnetic emission. Now, if you think of a photon sense, you have an energy of a photon. It then makes, say, two photons coming back. You, you don't have any more energy than you do at the pump photon. So those two photons have to be lower energy. That means the frequency is going to be lower, you know, according to Mr. Planck. So the two waves coming back are lower frequency, and the difference between, say, the pump frequency and the fre one of the frequencies coming back is the actual frequency of the oscillation in the plasma. You sit on the ground and you put a receiver there. And everybody nowadays has digital receivers. You record the data, you make spectrum, or you could listen to the, the, the sounds. So this is from HARP. This was back in 2012. This red line is the frequency we're broadcasting. It's a very high power frequency and it's offset from 4.3 megahertz by plus or minus 50 kilohertz. So we're sweeping here. And as you see, does anybody notice anything that happens when the frequency is right here? Anything really weird? Happens every time. It's because you're not looking close far enough away. That guy pops up. Every time, this is not an accident. Every time that frequency goes through there, this little mode pops up there and it keeps going, and this little mode when it pops up there. So this is a frequency that's offset by 100 kilohertz from the pump frequency, and it makes a, a nice figure, and we call this the glitch. This is the upshifted glitch and the downshifted glitch. In other words, in, in this field, if you don't know what's happening, you name it with a funny name. Then, as you come on, we get near the uh, harmonic of the gyro frequency. This is near the third gyro frequency. And, uh, you know, this electron gyro frequency is 1.6 megahertz at harp. You multiply by three and you get about 4.2. Here, you start getting this mode here, which is called the broad upshifted maximum. Again, you have no idea what it is, so you name it something. But later, you figure it out. It's due to some electron Bernstein wave interactions. And... Down here, you get the downshift to maximum and the second harmonic of the downshift to maximum, separated by lower, frequency, lower hybrid frequency. Now, let's do the same thing at 5.83 megahertz near the fourth electron cyclotron frequency. You take, um, is that correct? Let's see, um, let's see, uh, four times uh, 1.428, yeah, it's about right. Okay, and does anybody see any Glitchy things here. How about that little guy there? And, and these are the broad ups. So there is a similar feature there, and we don't understand what is happening. This is the broad upshift to maximum, and the second and the third harmonic of the broad upshift to maximum. And then offset from the pump frequency are these lower harbid offsets. So these are regularly produced indication of waves that are excited in the plasma. So we have stimulated electromagnetic emission generation by high power waves. The first thing you can do is you can have mode conversion on fetal line irregularities. We're sending up an electromagnetic wave. It's also called a light wave. It goes at the speed of light. It hits the plasma and then you find some irregularities. So it's like Paul Bernhardt walking into the women's restroom. He stops, he goes to the door, he's still not doing anything bad. He walks into the, I haven't changed. It's just where I am has changed. So right at the boundary of a field line irregularity, you're going from Mr. Electromagnetic to a different mode, which happens to be an electrostatic mode called a Langmuir wave. That is called mode mo conversion. I have now converted myself into a, yeah. <laughs> Bad analogy, I agree. <laughs> Into a Langmuir wave, and then I say to myself, I want to get out of here. <laughs> you know, I'm in the wrong place. So then he might then get excited, and he may parameter decay into uh, two other modes. 
that are a little more friendly modes. So you can say parametric decay into another Langmuir wave and a, an acoustic wave. Those are the two processes, mode conversion going from one across a boundary and then parametric decay decaying into two other waves. The ionospheric measurements at low frequency stimulated electromagnetic are called stimulated Brillouin scatter of ionacoustic waves. And the, we all know what a sound wave is. It goes at the speed of sound in the media. Turns out that that frequency tells you what the electron temperature is in the media. There's also stimulated Brillouin scatter into the ion cyclotron wave. That's that frequency that the ions go around the magnetic field, and that's very strongly dependent on the mass. So that tells you what the mass of the plasma is by measuring that frequency. And then the ion Bernstein main waves are actually uh, an electron acceleration resonance, but they also tell you you're right near a harmonic of the uh, magnetic field. A lot of physics in measuring these waves. But one thing is how do we know which wave we're going to generate and how do we generate the different waves? So what can you change? You can change the frequency, but the only other thing is you can change the direction relative to the magnetic field. So if you have your high power radio wave go along the magnetic field, you, you decay into an electromagnetic wave and an ion acoustic wave, and here is the spectrum. So here's the pump wave, and you see eight hertz below the pump is a very strong mode, and that's the stimulated Brillouin scatter. Here's time, uh, here's time versus frequency, and as you see, as time goes on, this mode evolves. So we said, well, that's sort of fun. Why don't we just see what that sounds like? So I'll repeat that. So what that is the mode sped up. How many of you can hear 8 hertz? I know Matt has, but he's, he's like the youngest person here. But the rest of us, we can't hear 8 hertz. So I had to really speed it up. You know, you take a tape recorder and run it a lot faster, 200 times faster, and then you can make it up. So this is the actual sound of the Brillouin scatter mode, the acoustic wave that's produced in the plasma if you demodulate it from the carrier, which is the pump wave. So that's one sound. Let's try now, let's take the magnetic field I'll take the beam and move it away from the magnetic field and see if we can excite another mode. I'll repeat that again. This is exciting that ion cyclotron frequency. And you see how pure that tone is? It's because it's a very well-defined line. And as time goes on, you go in and out of resonance. And it sounds sort of like bad Morse code to me. And so we have these ion acoustic frequencies here and then the ion cyclotron frequency down here. And that's because we moved the high power radio wave aw uh, away from the magnetic field direction. What else do we want to do? Why don't we just keep it here and then all of a sudden move it to the other direction? So when we were aligned with the magnetic field, we didn't get any waves at all. Then we moved it off the magnetic field, and we got this with, a, with the pump, the, the first harmonic and the second harmonic that was quite strong with that excitation. Finally, the coolest mode is the Ion Bernstein mode because it's got all these harmonics. How many know about a, how a flute works or a clarinet or, or just blowing a pipe? You get fundamental for a second, so you get all these harmonics and tell me if this doesn't sound like somebody's blowing on a pipe. So what you have is the mode, the electromagnetic wave, it decays or mode converts into electron Bernstein and then it converts into a whole bunch of, of harmonic modes that sound like this. So you see, you're blowing on your pipe and so you get all these harmonics here that are simultaneously being excited by the electromagnetic wave. And this occurs right at the second electrons, when you're heating right at the second harmonic of the electron cyclotron frequency. So, conclusions. 
HF excited sounds from the ionosphere can communicate the physics of the ionosphere. As you, you just have to know how to interpret what it's saying. High power radio waves excite radio emissions. Ion gyro tones provide ion composition. The ion sound tones provide the plasma temperature. And the ion Bernstein harmonics show the impact of the magnetic field, how close you are to tuning to the magnetic field. So active experiments complement passive remote sensing tools where you're just sending up a wave, exciting the plasma to talk to you, and stimulated electromagnetic emissions are rich in both audio and educational content. Thank you. Any questions for, for Maestro, <laughs> physics professor? Okay, thank you, thank you, Paul. Sure. Next up is uh, Dr. Matt Hebner. Uh, Matt is the uh, Program Manager for uh, Data Science, Global Security Intelligence and Emerging Threats at Los Alamos National Laboratory. Thanks, Bob, and thanks everyone for coming today. Um, I'm sorry I had to go after Paul. I don't have laser light shows or, or any AV. Um, <laughs> And this is actually the same slide deck that I went through this morning. This morning I was really focused around um, sort of why we do what I'm going to describe today, this afternoon to you. Um, I really focused on what the strategic impacts were from sort of a national security perspective. Um, I'll conclude with those same sort of uh, thoughts about why, why we need to do this kind of research with HARP. Um, and in the Arctic specifically. But what I want to do is take some time this afternoon and, and spend a little bit more time on why Los Alamos and the Department of Energy are, are interested in, in the ionosphere. Um, to set the frame, uh, first, uh, Dave Szynski deserves all of the credit uh, for doing a lot of this research. I'm a program manager, so I, I get to facilitate a lot of this research, but Dave Szynski was very involved. He put together this slide deck, so he gets all the credit, and I, I get all the blame for this presentation. <clears throat> um, I also want to offer another analogy as, as people who may or may not be so familiar with the ionosphere think about um, what we're trying to do. Uh, the analogy I proposed this morning also is um, thinking about looking, standing above a swimming pool and looking at the surface and trying to see a quarter down underneath the water. Um, and if you, if you try to, if you get a perfectly smooth surface on the pool, you can see if it's where the quarter is exactly and if it's heads or tails perhaps even. Um, if some wind kicks up, you'll see multiple quarters. You want to know exactly where it is, and it's, it's all blurred. But to add to that analogy, there's also the reflection you would see off of the surface of water. So you might see, you know, an inverted person, or you'll see, see, see uh, also light that's reflected off of the water. So that's the analogy I want to think of um, as we're looking at, at signals that start on one side of the ionosphere on the ground primarily, and then we're sensing from satellites, or we're looking at uh, waves that are, are, are bounced off of the ionosphere and, and come back to the Earth. So that's, that's the analogy that I'll refer to a couple of times on this talk. Um, what I'll talk through uh, today is um, the current motivation for Department of Energy supporting Los Alamos um, to do some of this research, um, some of the active experiment heritage at Los Alamos. We've been doing active experiments uh, in the ionosphere since about 1957. So I've got one slide to go through uh, uh, some of that, that heritage. Um, and then I'll talk about a couple of uh, recent experiments in the last year or two that uh, part, part of them involved HARP. I'll talk through those and then uh, return to sort of why, why we're doing this research, what it means, um, and then wrap up by acknowledging everybody that actually does the work and makes it all possible. Um, all right. Um, So the current motivation for Los Alamos to work on ionosphere, uh, better, better characteriz characterization and understanding the ionosphere is really this uh, support to the Department of Energy uh, to develop sensors to provide to Department of Defense to support the United States nuclear detonation detection uh, system and capability. And so the work on this program dates back to the 1960s, and, and uh, President Kennedy actually came out to the national labs before he agreed to sign the partial test ban treaty, which, which said there's going to be no, no nuclear testing uh, in the ocean, in the atmosphere, or in, in outer space. 
And before President Kennedy would commit to uh, signing that treaty, he wanted to make sure we had the capability to, to monitor the globe to understand if anybody was violating that treaty. And so uh, Los Alamos National Labs and Sandia National Lab um, build and provide the capability to verify, to do the, the test ban treaty verification um, to the nation. And so this, this means that we've developed over 1,400 sensors and flown those on over 75 satellites. And so just a very brief overview of that, that system, it's, it's kind of the reverse GPS. I, I mentioned this this morning. Typically, we have GPS receivers. We're driving around in the car. Um, we're using that to navigate, and we're receiving signals from the GPS constellation. And so we depend on that being available globally. If we want to measure something globally, that's a great host. And so we develop the sensors that fly on the GPS constellation. The brightest um, uh, RF signature, the brightest and the fastest RF signature that's produced would be from a nuclear detonation. So that has a unique signature that these sensors on the GPS satellites could measure. And so with the global, global coverage of the GPS systems, we're able to monitor the globe to make sure that nobody's violating the, the, the test ban treaty. Um, but what... The, the, there's multiple phenomenologies on the satellites. There's optical, there's radio frequency RF, um, there's X-ray, gamma ray, neutron detectors. For the RF signal specifically, that signal has to go through the ionosphere. So back to the pool analogy, if the quarter is sitting at the bottom and there's no disturbances, it's a completely, completely calm ionosphere, which is very unlikely, then we would know exactly where it is. But if, if there's any disturbances or scintillations in the ionosphere, then we need to be able to correct for those and correctly identify, characterize, locate where that, that nuclear explosion occurred. Um, and if you're not as familiar with, uh, if you're not steeped in the lab culture like I am, every now and then I have to remind myself, hopefully we'll never see anything. That's, that's one of the real challenges with working with this system. And so we can use proxy uh, signals such as lightning or such as experiments that we can do at HARP to test and make sure that the system is working. And again, hopefully we'll never measure anything with the system that we're really investing exquisite capability in maintaining. Um, so in, order, in addition to the operational uh, sensors and making sure that those are working, the, the Department of Energy invests in continually improving that capability, um, ideally to drive down cost to achieve more uh, satisfaction of requirements for Department of Defense. Um, and so there's also uh, a number of test uh, or experimental satellites. Uh, we call them demonstration and validation. So we demonstrate new technology or we validate new on-orbit uh, algorithms or capabilities. And we have to do that through testing sort of corner cases or extremely disturbed ionosphere. Um, we have to do experiments. And for some reason, the Air Force, and I think probably the world, doesn't like us tweaking the knobs on the GPS satellites. And so we're not able to do that on operational satellites. So we can use these, these DEMVAL satellites um, to do basic science and to test, test new technology that goes into the, uh, into the, con into the, the capability. Um, and so the last paragraph, you see the USNDS re related work has been supported by the execution of about 100 space-based active experiments. Um, so I'm going to switch to one slide uh, that talks about sort of Los Alamos's and Department of Energy, and before that, the Atomic Energy Commission's uh, interest in active experiments in space. Um, it dates back to about 1957, and that's when uh, Department of Energy, so this was before the uh, limited test ban treaty or the partial test ban treaties were signed. And so the U.S. was developing delivery platforms, rockets, um, and uh, the nuclear devices. And so there was a lot of testing. There was atmospheric testing. And there were, there were 10 atmospheric tests that Los Alamos was involved in um, starting in 1957. And uh, this is the orange nuclear event that was about over 40 mega, uh, sorry, 4 megatons at above an altitude of about four, uh, 40 kilometers. Uh, in the atmosphere. And so this is kind of I hate the analogy back to the swimming pool. This is the, the cannonball into the swimming pool and looking at what does moving all of that mass of water around do to signal propagation, do to the ionosphere? How long does it take to recover from this single kind of event? And what, what are the, all of the physics uh, that, that goes along with this, this type of event occurring in the middle atmosphere and then propagating up to the ionosphere and, and, and those layers that we've talked about in some of the earlier talks? Um, so the orange nuclear event is the, the upper left. Uh, the lower left is uh, paired with a, a picture just taken by somebody standing on the beach and observing this NASA CRESS experiment. So this is a chemical release experiment uh, in the early 90s. 
And that was a, a satellite release of uh, a chemical, uh, uh, chemical release into the, into the ionosphere um, to understand what, what that would do to the ionosphere and also provide some diagnostics and some optical signatures that were measured, that were easy to measure. Um, that was at an altitude of about uh, 35,000 kilometers. And so these two examples, the orange nuclear event at 40 kilometers and then the, the NASA crest release at about 35,000 kilometers sort of shows the range and altitudes that Los Alamos has been involved with. And, and not Los Alamos exclusively, Los Alamos with a lot of, of scientific partners throughout uh, the government and the academic community. Um, the, the lower middle image is uh, a 19, early 1990 uh, Department of Energy bare uh, rocket experiment that was uh, an electro, uh, sorry, a neutral particle beam uh, that was launched in a rocket and used um, to, as part of the, the Reagan era uh, SDI or Star Wars experiment to understand if, if we could propagate uh, charged particle beams or neutral particle beams in this case. And one of the big challenges that was addressed in, the, in this was actually just uh, dealing with spacecraft charging. If you're, if you're trying to accelerate particles, um, and the way this one worked was it accelerated uh, charged helium and then it, it neutralized those so that it could propagate farther through the space environment because it was a neutral particle rather than a charged particle, going to some of what, what we just heard from Paul's talk. These, these charged particles interact with all the electric fields and magnetic fields. Neutral particles can travel farther. So for getting the beam to travel a farther distance, you want to neutralize the charged particles that you're accelerating within the rocket. But all of, that all of those charges lead to serious issues with spacecraft charging. And that's applicable to a lot of commercial, I mean, that, that's an issue not just with, with charged particles, uh, accelerators in space. But this was an experiment, in, again, in, in the early 90s that Los Alamos was involved with. Um, Los Alamos and a large, broad community also was involved with uh, other chemical releases. This is on the upper right, just an example of a, a barium release. The barium uh, neutral particles are photoionized, so that means uh, the neutral particles, when they hit sunlight, an electron is kicked off, and so then they're charged particles, and then you can use those to trace out and understand electric field, magnetic field, and, and the space environment. Finally, in the lower right is a more recent uh, tool that Los Alamos has developed. It's the Los Alamos Portable Pulsar, and this is a it's not nearly the energy of a nuclear detonation, so I'd, I'd say it's more like a, a, a synthetic lightning flash. And this is a way that we can uh, characterize signal propagation from the portable pulsar uh, up to the GPS satellites and the new de detection system that's on there and use that to validate um, all of the system performance requirements that DOD has on the system. Um, it's called a portable pulsar, and that primarily comes back to uh, it's hard to get permanent building locations, and so we put it on the flatbed of a truck, and it's portable, but it's never moved. Um, so it's sitting at Los Alamos, um, and the problem with the, back to my analogy of a swimming pool, the swimming pool in Los Alamos is pretty flat, which is great if you want to find the quarter, but if you want to test your system performance when there's waves, you need to go somewhere else. And so the equatorial ionosphere has more scintillations, and then the auroral Arctic uh, ionosphere also has more scintillations. So with this Los Alamos portable pulsar, we're able to validate the system performance when things are quiet. When the pool is quiet, we do a good job. Um, and this takes us on into the next three or four slides where I'm going to talk about more current research efforts to sort of uh, splash the pool a little bit. We're not going to do a cannonball. Hopefully never, <laughs> nobody will do a cannonball again. But we want to splash the water a little bit and uh, make sure we understand the system performance. So ESINT um, was a DOE-funded program uh, for a couple of years to go down uh, and set up at Kwajalein and uh, transmit a number of continuous waves, so single tone. I, I, I need Paul to help me with more audio tracks of this, but a single tone uh, radio frequency signal and then a sweep radio frequency signal. And what we want to understand um, the pool analogy falls apart a little bit here, but let me think uh, if, we, if we make the, the light uh, analogy for the, for the atmosphere, um, why is the sky blue and why do sunsets turn red? Different frequencies of light behave differently through the atmosphere. And so what we wanna do with this experiment is understand are all the different wavelengths or frequencies of electromagnetic of RF radiation performing the same way as they go through the, the ionosphere? So um, if we had a signal at 20 megahertz, does it go through with no loss of power 
and do 40 megahertz signals get their power cut in half or are they scattered differently? And so that's what we're trying to understand with this experiment. And what I'd point out is, um, so this F coherent, the, the coherence frequency has to do with that different colors or different frequencies of RF propagating through the ionosphere. And so how broad do we get the same propagation at different frequencies as we sweep through a frequency band? Um, S4 is a scintillation index, and so that tells us how, how ripply the swimming pool is or how much disturbance, how much scintillation there is in the ionosphere. Um, so this impulsive radio frequency detection performance assessment in scintillated ionospheres that I've described to you is really the motivation for doing this work. So you can see we had to go down to Kwajalein, and we spent about a month uh, for three different periods in 2014, 2015. And again, Dave Szynski got to do this. I got to sit at home and make sure the bills were paid to do it. So Dave gets the credit and he gets to have all the fun. So I don't feel too much. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so for these, we had to camp out for about um, a month uh, at Kwajalein. Um, so that was just significant logistics to get out there. Um, and the ionosphere didn't cooperate. The, the pool wasn't splashy enough to see what we wanted. Um, and so what we did following up on this, I mean, we've got some preliminary results that were very interesting. And I think the next slide talks a little bit about that. So I think Paul actually had one more equation than I do, so I don't feel quite so bad. <laughs> but these are the only two equations here. The coherence bandwidth has a scaling law, so it goes about to the fourth power with frequency. And then the scintillation index also is proportional, has a proportional relationship with frequency. So both of those depend on frequencies. Um, the slide, is showing the S4 index, so how, how ripply is the swimming pool, is the x-axis, and then how broad is the coherence bandwidth on the upper plot and on the lower plot. So for the upper plot, we're looking at the measurements from 30 to 44 megahertz, so we're looking at, at fairly lower, low, low frequencies um, that we were able to measure and, prop, uh, and transmit from the ground. And then the bottom panel is extrapolating those using those two scaling laws on the right to uh, more representative frequencies for the US NDS mission. So this was, this was a result slide that shows we did get a trend of decreasing coherence bandwidth with increasing scintillation. So the more splashy the, the swimming pool was, the, the narrower limit or the more change in how different frequencies of RF uh, propagated through the, through the ionosphere. So that was the punchline for this study, but we really wanted to see um, extreme scintillation. We're interested in um, if, somebody, if there's really disturbed ionospheric conditions. Uh, what, what are the signals? So this is where finally we're getting to HARP and the Arctic. Um, what we wanted to do was the same fundamental question of transmit both continuous wave and sweep frequency signals to a satellite receiver through a HARP-driven disturbed ionosphere. So use HARP in a, a dual mode, uh, uh, you know, half of the transmitters basically providing heating and, and to, to, to keep flogging the analogy, to splash the pool, to cause ripples in the pool, and then the, the other half of HARP to transmit a probe signal to a satellite um, that then we could measure the, the, the power we receive and do that as both a CW, uh, a continuous wave, sort of, sort of a monotone, and then also free, sweep the frequency through. Um, and so we want to understand and uh, determine the irregular, irregularity spectral density function to use for the mission that we're maintaining. Um, and then also just to understand VHF signal detection and propagation through structured ionosphere. So HARP provided the perfect tool to do this. Um, the big benefit of HARP being we could have scintillation on demand. We could use HARP to drop a pebble in the pool. Um, and Another big component uh, that was really a headache with Quaj, uh, with Kwajalein was, was just getting uh, FCC and uh, because Kwajalein is international, getting the approvals to, to transmit, whereas uh, HARP and the University of Alaska provided a lot of that logistics already through their licenses. <clears throat> um, oh, the, the, the figure on the upper right is a little bit dark, but this just is a graphic that uh, Paul provided actually to Dave Szynski, il illustrating the, the dual mode uh, where we have the, the main heating beam and then a probe beam off to the side and a satellite passing over HARP. Um, and so you can see we did three campaigns up in HARP, but instead of month-long campaigns up there, we only had to do a couple of days. We, we went during the HARP campaigns and we could execute these experiments. 
Um, and so these are just some of the details of the configuration. We used a, a almost six megahertz pump signal and then an almost 10 megahertz probe signal. Um, we used, Paul talked about this twisted beam operation um, and the different modes that HARP can operate in. Um, and we had about eight satellite passes per each one of these campaigns. Um, and then we were transmitting through these uh, different beams up uh, more in the 100, 150 megahertz range. Um, and so the results were that we could uh, generate scintillation in the probe signal with much higher S4 indices. So the Kwajalein uh, S4 indice never exceeded about 0.8. And here we can get uh, S4 scintillation indices of, of between one and two. Um, there were major delay layer absorption event. Unfortunately, during, uh, I mean, nature, nature still bats last and has the biggest bat for the ionosphere. Um, so there was a delay absorption uh, event during this campaign, second campaign, that eliminate, limited some of the useful data collection. Um, and so we're still, we're still working on this great data set that we were able to collect um, thanks, thanks to the, the HARP capabilities. Um, so this is returning a little bit um, to some of the strategic implications or, or where, you know, in addition to the US NDS, that, that critical national mission that, that Los Alamos is supporting, um, the DOE labs, uh, along with DOD uh, national labs, are supporting the two departments to look at modernization of the nuclear command and control and communication system. Um, and part of this uh, includes integrated uh, modeling and simulation capability so that um, when the departments have questions about will communications work uh, in various environments, we can um, say, yes, this model can simulate that question and we validated it with experimental uh, 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 controlled ex experiments such as the ones at HARP. So if, if uh, DOD wants to ensure that there's nuclear command and control um, in uh, scintillated or uh, disturbed ionospheric conditions, we can provide modeling capability to answer those questions that are validated by active experiments at HARP. Um, and just to, to wrap up along those lines a little bit more, um, I think there's, there's, there's really sort of three main drivers um, to really in, in, uh, keep the capability that HARP provides and, and do more focused research around Arctic and disturbed ionospheres. And those I would characterize as just the growth in space. And so we heard a lot of discussion about standing up Space Force. So there's, national, there's obvious national security um, drivers to, to understand both Arctic and space uh, operating in Arctic and space environments. Um, we also see uh, with the national security strategy and sort of this return to, to, to thinking globally about global security in peer adversary capabilities. And so sort of moving, not diminishing the counterterrorism missions that the, the federal government needs to, to engage in, but returning to, to peer adversary concerns. And so those sorts of, of issues drive a lot of this, this kind of work. Um, but I think there's also an increasing growth in civil reliance um, on ionospheric signal propagation. And GPS, again, is the perfect example of that. Everybody's, did everybody use their phone to navigate here? I mean, that's the way, I, I know if I flew in last night and the pilots relied on GPS. So there's this huge civilian reliance on signal propagation through the ionosphere. And finally, the increase in commercial activity in space. Um, I was lucky enough to go out to SpaceX and visit there about five years ago, and they were very excited about manned commercial, you know, tourism to space. And we just asked if they'd even thought about um, high energy particle fluxes and what they would do, you know, are they gonna do like uh, NASA does with ISS or what are they thinking about as they go to Mars? And they were like, what are you talking about? <laughs> so I, government has a strong role in the national labs, have a responsibility to do the homework so that when SpaceX realizes, oh, we've got a problem, we've got the answer for you. Um, so this just increased interest in space and the Arctic really drives the need for, for more of this kind of work. Um, and I think my final slide is acknowledgments. And this barely scratches the surface, especially when I did the uh, historic look at, at Los Alamos's role in active experiments in space. These acknowledgments are really just the folks who were involved in uh, making um, the ESINT experiment and then the follow-on work at HARP actually uh, succeeds. So there's a lot of uh, folks in the audience are acknowledged here, but this is, this is just a subset of, of the acknowledgments that are really owed um, for the work that I presented. 
And as a final comment, let me mention that uh, the historic, the heritage slide was drawn heavily from a paper that Maury Pongratz published in December of 2018. And uh, it was a look at um, history of Los Alamos participation in active experiments in space. And so that was in Frontiers of Physics in December of 2018. So if you're interested in digging into that, um, there's a lot more information in Maury's paper and I definitely Stole all the uh, stole all the information and, and view graphs or images from him uh, with his knowledge. So, um, thank you very much, and I'd be happy to take any quick questions. Or even a slow question. <laughs> <laughs> any questions for Matt? Okay. Thanks, thanks, Matt. Our our, our sweep up presentation is by Professor. Dave Heisel, he's at Cornell University, where he's a, the chairman of the Department of Earth and Atmospheric Sciences in the College of Engineering. And Dave's gonna talk about science of active experiments. Thanks, Bob. Well, we get that up. Um, gee, I don't know what to tell you. I don't have any uh, nuclear detonations to show you, uh, nor sound effects, nor inappropriate metaphors. <laughs> Uh, we don't do those things at Cornell, but uh, I, I do have a good story to tell you, I hope. And um, uh, what I want to talk to you about is, is astronomy and space physics. So this is what I study, and I study things that go on uh, naturally in space. And you'd be sur surprised how complicated the problem is. You know, few people really appreciate, you know, the complicated uh, dynamics and structure of the ionosphere. Uh, but I have to uh, confess to having a certain amount of envy for my friends over in, you know, the physics department, the chem chemistry department, where they do, you know, real experiments, you know, where you, you know, mix some chemicals together or turn on your apparatus and you get some result. And if you do it again, you get the same result. And if your friend does it in another country, after reading your paper, your friend will get the same uh, result or you're not friend. And, uh, and that's kind of how science is supposed to progress, right? A scientific method, a hypothesis testing. But in nature, it just doesn't work that way. You know, nature never does the same thing twice. And so how do you, uh, how do, you do a repeatable experiment? How do you, you know, test your hypothesis if the aurora is never the same twice, if uh, equatorial spread out is never the same twice? So you're just constantly trying to play this game of disambiguation and teasing out patterns and filling in the gaps with numerical simulations and things like that. But um, this is what ionospheric modification gives you the opportunity to do. You can actually perform proper experiments like they taught you to do in school in the ionosphere, and, and hopefully if you do the same thing a couple of times or ten times or, or every day, you get the same result. And so it allows potentially, you know, very fast closure on science problems that would otherwise be very vexing. And so that's what I want to talk about here. I want to talk about using ionospheric modifications to study the natural world. And, you know, the elevator speech is, is this, what we're really studying in, with some method, is, is what happens when you push the ionosphere out of equ equilibrium. You know, by what manner does it come back? And, and what can you learn about that from the, the way that the ionosphere recovers? And, uh, and that's just really basic research. And so I'm going to talk about four problems in basic aronomy and space physics research. And then if you really are interested in, in applications, I mean, what, what I'm really doing here is creating or suppressing and diagnosing uh, artificial plasma density irregularities. Uh, uh, which can both promote and interfere with operational communication systems depending on what you're doing, and which in any case mimic the kinds of uh, natural uh, phenomena that occur anyway, uh, that occur in space even if you're not doing ionospheric modification experiments. So that's kind of the idea. And uh, I want to talk about four different kinds of experiments that, that we've done uh, that have all sort of uh, along these, uh, this theme. I want to talk about thermoparametric instability, which I'll explain in a minute. Uh, which is something that occurs in the ionospheric E region, um, well, in the F region and the E region. I'm going to be uh, showing some E region results. I'm going to talk about air glow. Uh, Evgeny Mission gave a great talk about electron, uh, electron acceleration leading to ionization in the ionosphere, and that's something you can diagnose by looking at it uh, with air glow. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, artificial periodic inhomogeneity, which is a, a mouthful. But it's also a real killer app, I think, for ionospheric modifications uh, because it uh, gives us insight into, uh, into a region of space that we just really couldn't interrogate otherwise. And I want to uh, conclude with some um, uh, observations of some so suboral sporadic E layers and, and hopefully a movie that'll play for you that, uh, that really shows uh, what ionospheric modification can do for us uh, studying the natural world. So um, it's a little bit washed out, but these are some of the first um, ionospheric modification data I ever took. So the date here is, is 2008, and what I'm showing is radar data. So there's a small uh, radar system that we have in Homer, Alaska. It's a few hundred kilometers away from Gakona, where HARP is. 
And, uh, and the idea is it looks at very low elevation angles, so, uh, so the, the radar rays are going out almost at the horizon, and they're cutting across the region of space that's modified uh, by, by HARP. And uh, it just so happens that this radar is sensitive to plasma density irregularities in the ionospheric E region right over HARP. And so this is, this is uh, time, this is uh, uh, UT, but this is really during the middle of the day, local time. And this is range, which is sort of slant range. So really we're cutting across the modified volume over HARP from the nearest part to the farthest part. And the, the brightness here sort of tells you the intensity of the echoes and the, the hue tells you about the Doppler shift, which I'm not really going to focus on. And, and what we're doing is we're looking at density irregularities created over HARP by uh, the emission of HF waves. And, and they're not unlike density irregularities that occur by natural processes, say auroral driven processes. And the instability that's at work here is, is called the thermoparametric instability, which is easy to understand. So you imagine that uh, there are just nascent little tiny irregularities uh, in space in the E region of the ionosphere at this case, little, little bumps or little holes in electron density that are just there naturally. And now you shine electromagnetic radiation on these uh, from below with HARP. And what that does is it causes the little irregularities to polarize. They're like little dielectric blobs and they polarize. And associated with that is an electric field. And at a resonance frequency, say the upper hybrid resonance frequency that Paul talk, talked about, that electric field becomes very, very big. And it gives rise to heating. And this wave-driven heating just thermally forces things. And it makes what was already a small density depletion even smaller. It makes it, you know, if there's a little bit of a rarefication, it makes it even more rare. And now the whole process continues and you have instability. And then it turns out this, the, uh, the, uh, the irregularities that are created are sort of meter scales. And we can scatter off of them and diagnose them with a low power radar. This, this radar is a few kilowatts. And so here we did an experiment where we're just pointing the heart beam around. So the, the modified volume was uh, nearer than farther, then nearer than farther, then nearer than farther. And here we were sort of ramping up and ramping down. Uh, the power level is used by HARP. It turns out you can generate and sustain these irregularities with a very, very small fraction of the power that's available. And over here, we were modifying the, um, the frequency, the heating frequency, from below uh, 3 megahertz to above 3 megahertz. 3 megahertz is about twice the electron gyro frequency. The literature at that time said that this uh, phenomena shouldn't work at pump frequencies below twice the electron gyro harmonic frequency. But I wasn't familiar with the literature, so it worked just fine. <laughs> and uh, it really tells you, you, you know, maybe you shouldn't read too much before you go and do experiments. And uh, so that's uh, something that we did. And that was like my first experiment like 10 years ago. It worked great. I thought, oh, this is easy. Gee, this is easy. Um, it's really washed out here, but uh, it turns out our radar is an imaging radar. It's like the VLA, and it uses uh, space receivers on the ground, and you can make images of uh, things sort of in, in the plan view. And this is what I'm showing is images of the modified region over HARP. So it's hard to see it, but I've got uh, the radiation pattern of HARP here shown with some contours, and I'm using Paul's uh, sort of twisted beam mode here, which is like a donut with a hole in the middle. And here we are pointing at zenith, and then a little bit closer to magnetic zenith, a little bit closer to magnetic zenith, and a little bit closer to magnetic zenith. This is at magnetic, magnetic zenith. And what we can really watch is the modified volume sort of uh, move around and shift around, and uh, we can kind of validate the fact that the harp uh, beam pattern is the right one, and that our regularities are sort of tracing it out. But it turns out as you move from zenith to magnetic zenith, the, um, the pattern doesn't quite follow what you would get if you just had a searchlight. And this is just basically showing us some interesting phenomena, uh, some interesting aspects of, of refraction of the radio signals working their way up. And also, it turns out there's a preference for, for backscatter from irregularities, so they're a little bit closer to the north here than to the south. Um, I have a movie of that if you want to see it later, but in the interest of time, I'll, I'll skip it. But it's kind of cute. And then this is some experiments that we did last summer. And uh, this really shows the power of HARP, which is a, a subtle power, which is it's extremely well calibrated and extremely well characterized. So you can do really, really quantitative experiments. And what we were doing here is we were, say, at distance and in time, we started very gradually ramping up the emission from HARP, ramping up, ramping up, ramping up until, until irregularities appeared. And at that point, we know the onset. We know the threshold. What's the minimum amount of power that it takes to turn on these irregularities? And it turns out that that amount of power is very, very small. It's, it's you know, percents or less of the available uh, ERP at HARP. And we keep ramping up, ramping up, ramping up, and then we turn it off. Uh, this figure doesn't show it, but it turns out you can sustain these irregularities once you turn them on with practically no power, which is kind of interesting. So we did this again and again, and uh, the other thing we did is we modified the, the pump frequency. So this is the lowest pump frequency, a little bit higher, a little bit higher, a little bit higher. We're all kind of running around between about 2.7 and maybe 3.2 3 megahertz 
uh, higher, 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 and then we recycled. And so uh, it's a little bit hard to see it, but as we're ramping up the harp frequency, we're ramping up the altitude where the interaction is taking place. So over here, it's uh, maybe a little bit below 100 kilometers, and over here, it's a little bit above 100, 100 kilometers. And what we're testing is just that we're measuring exactly how much power does it take to turn on this phenomena. And um, it's in my contract that I have to show equations uh, whenever I go talk. Uh, in fact, my bonuses are tied to how many equations I show, so, so be careful, look out. Uh, so anyway, it turns out that this phenomenon is pretty straightforward and where it can work in the domain of linear theory because we're talking about threshold, you know, when things are just getting started. So if you write down all the conservation equations for, for number density and for uh, momentum and for energy, you can combine them together into what's a huge eigenvalue problem. And uh, so I've got a couple equations here for perturbed electron temperature, perturbed electron number density versus height. And, um, and this is uh, the heating, the differential heating that HARP is actually supplying at, uh, as a function of height in the vicinity of the upper hybrid height. And this is a big eigenvalue problem. And I don't know why this is black and white. That's strange. Um, but uh, it's a big eigenvalue problem. You can solve it. So I'm showing here the eigenmodes for the, the lowest order. This is the temperature perturbation. This is the density perturbation versus height in the vicinity of the modified region. This is what the, uh, the differential uh, heating looks like. And the eigenvalue is whatever, whatever you want it to be. So we can set the growth rate for these irregularities to zero because we're at threshold. Uh, we know how much, uh, uh, what the electric field is at the interaction height because we can kind of propagate that up from the ground. And we know exactly what the gain of the HARP array is. We know exactly what the, uh, the emission power is. So take any parameter here that you don't think you know very well and call that the eigenvalue. And I'm interested in this one because uh, this is the uh, heat lost by electrons per collision due to inelastic collisions. And it turns out that is a poorly known geophysical parameter. And it turns up in calculations of neutral uh, of natural, you know, plasma irregularities and instabilities all the time. And now, now we can solve for it. And we can solve for this as a function of altitude by doing this very, very precise measurement of threshold. And, you know, we can do this in a very fine-grained way because HARP allows you to tune, uh, to turn up the, uh, the um, uh, vector radiated power in very, very, very small increments. And you can be completely confident that, uh, uh, that you know how much uh, power it's emitting. And so th we were able to measure this and measure this as a function of altitude. So it's like a barometer. And uh, it's just not something you just couldn't get any other way. So that's the kind of experiment I really like to do. Uh, I'm going to switch gears here and turn to Airglow. We have a, a, a cheapy little spectrometer at HARP with a, you know, sort of an icon camera lens sitting on the top of it. And what I'm doing here is looking at wavelengths, and uh, we're turning HARP on and off. You know, full power, pointing at zenith. And this is an F region experiment. And you can see here, you know, the red line turning on and off. Isn't that neat? And here's green line turning on and off. And it's really hard to see because I have too many lines plotted here, but they actually we could see five lines turning on and off. So we could do 7474 and blue line and, um, and uh, a near-infrared line over here. And what I'm plotting is five curves on top of one another showing these emissions turning on and off. And uh, some of these emissions uh, require energetic electrons to turn on, and uh, we know that this is therefore evidence of, of electron acceleration and a population of energetic electrons being created by heating, which is exciting. Uh, you know, this is the sort of thing you'd like to study, say, in a rural uh, context, where you'd like to sort of diagnose the, uh, the population of energetic electrons, but here we can turn them on and off, and so we can learn all kinds of things about energetic electron transport and production uh, using this experiment. So um, here's another equation. I mean, if you knew everything about what was going on in space, including this, this is the, you know, the number density of energetic electrons as a function of altitude and energy. If you knew the spectrum of the electrons, you could figure out for each emission line what the intensity should be in rallies. It's a straightforward problem. That's not what we know. What we know is we have five digits over here, five measurements of this, and I'd like to back out a two-dimensional function from that. This is, you know, infinite dimensional space, and we have five parameters to fix it. But it turns out you can kind of do it. And so this is the target. I'd like to figure out from our HARP air glow data what the energetic electron population is that gave rise to the air glow. So we do some numerical tests. So we had a, a, a student build a model, a computational model, that says what happens if you inject energetic electrons at this energy you know, 50 eV at this altitude, 200 kilometers, which happened to be the interaction height for this experiment, where in equilibrium do all those en uh, energetic electrons turn up? And so this is a, it's an energetic electron transport model that includes all the things that can happen to energetic electrons as they work their way back to the ground state. 
and uh, in, including you know, transport up and down along the magnetic field line, but also all the things that degrade energetic electrons and secondary production, everything else. So in equilibrium, this is what you would get if you introduce uh, electrons at a certain rate of production at this energy and at this altitude. And what I'm really showing you here is a member of a Green's function. Because I can generate this kind of curve for energetic electrons at any energy. And now what I can do is I can say, well, how do I superimpose these Green's functions such that I predict the, um, uh, the air glow that I actually observed? And this is the curve that we get. So this is the production, of, uh, production rate of energetic electrons at 200 kilometers altitude as a function of energy. And there's an inverse method that gives us this curve that sort of makes it better than other curves. This is an underdetermined problem, but this one uh, meets certain sort of information theory theoretic uh, criteria. And lo and behold, if that's the production rate at 200 kilometers altitude, uh, we can uh, predict the air glow in Rayleigh is very close to what we actually measured in Rayleigh's within experimental error. Now you can take all of these production rates, stick them back through the Green's functions, and figure out what the total population of energetic electrons had to have been. Now you can take this and say, okay, these energetic electrons, they can create ionization. So this is non-ionizing radiation coming up from HARP, but it creates ionization. And uh, if we put that into a model, we can predict what the uh, uh, electron number density profile looked like before the heater turned on, which is this curve, and then after the heater turned on, which is that curve, the dashed line. And it's not plotted here, but we have data from an ionosan that looks very much like this. So this is the, uh, the layer production that uh, Evgeny and Paul have spoken about, only inferred entirely empirically, no theory. So now I want to switch gears again, and I want to talk about artificial periodic inhomogeneity, which is a killer app. And I'll tell you why that is in a minute. This is this alone ought to pay for a heater. And, uh, and the idea is the following. You emit uh, electromagnetic ra radiation vertically. Uh, at some point at the critical height, it reflects. You get a standing wave. So this is a standing wave of electric field, or electric field squared. And uh, that gives rise to uh, heating. And that gives rise to a very, very small variation in electron number density that follows the standing wave pattern. So uh, uh, crests and uh, troughs and crests and troughs and crests and troughs. And at different altitudes, the mechanism that produces the, uh, the density irregularity is different. But uh, the interesting thing about this is this, uh, the waveform you get here, the standing wave, is precisely the standing wave that will scatter radiation launched at the pump frequency. It, the, the Bragg scattering condition is met identically by this waveform that you've just built in by turning on the heater. So if you had a radar operating at the same frequency as, as the, uh, the heater, you could scatter off of all of this. And of course, we do have a radar because it's the heater. So what you do is you turn on the heater for a long time, say a second, this is X mode, turn on the heater for a long time, create the artificial periodic inhomogeneities, and then you use the harp in, in, in radar mode and you transmit a series of short pulses, and you probe the irregularities that you just created, and you watch them do whatever it is that they're going to do. So you've built these irregularities in over here, and now you're going to probe them and see what happens. And this is the kind of data that you get. So here we, uh, we heat for a second. That's where there's a, a, a white strip here. Don't worry about this. It's another experiment. We heat for a second, and then we scatter, and we probe, and we watch the irregularities that we just created decay. And we get a couple pieces of information out of this. One is the Doppler shift, which is small, but look at the error bars. I mean, the Doppler shifts are a couple meters per second, but the error bars are smaller than that. And we're doing coherent scatter off of you know, pretty strong density uh, uh, irregularities here, and uh, we can measure the Doppler shift very, very well. And more interesting than that, what we get is a decay time. There are two curves plotted here, and they're supposed to be in color, but uh, the longer one is the decay time in seconds of these irregularities. The decay time is controlled by the diffusion of the irregularities, which is controlled by the collision frequency with neutrals, which is controlled by the neutral number density, or the neutral pressure. So oh, these are horrible colors. But here I'm plotting you know, Doppler shifts for you know, an hour, a couple hours. And here I'm pl plotting decay time, which is indicative of neutral pressure. This is a measurement of what the neutrals are doing, what the neutral atmosphere is doing. Because the Doppler shifts here, that's just vertical neutral winds. That's the only agent that's involved at these altitudes. And this is, this is neutral pressure. And uh, this is the only technique I know of that will give you this kind of measurement at this fidelity of the neutral atmosphere, of the lower thermosphere. 
And you know, it's just profound to be able to make this kind of measurement, and there's really no other way to do it. And so if you're interested in studying uh, neutral orionomy, uh, this is a great way to do it. If you do this experiment for a long time, you can often see gravity waves propagating through it very unambiguously. And uh, you know, this is you know, indicative of, of, of drag. And there's no reason why you couldn't do this measurement at higher altitudes. We just happen to run at a frequency where we're probing at this altitude. So if you want to study neutral pressure, neutral satellite drag, you know, this would be a way of doing it. And like I said, it's the only ground-based measurement that I know that's capable of this. So it really is a killer app. Finally, um, we had a really great set of experiments uh, a couple of uh, years. This is right before uh, the Air Force was threatening to shut down the facility. So I thought this was going to be our last set of experiments. And so we're running our radar here in Homer, Alaska, uh, range to the uh, irregularities time. This is middle of the day. And I saw all these little streaks. The vertical streaks are just because uh, every now and then we turn off the heater to distinguish between what's natural and what's, what's artificial. So don't worry about that. But these diagonal streaks, thermoparametric instability, diagonal streaks. And uh, this didn't really surprise me because for many, many years I've been going to the Caribbean, going to Arecibo with the heater off, no heater, measuring streaks that look just like this naturally. And here we are doing it at HARP artificially. By the way, we're up at 4.5 megahertz here. At those kinds of frequencies, if you're seeing E region backscatter, there's a sporadic E layer, a dense sporadic E layer. And that's what I've been waiting for for years and years at HARP, to see a dense sporadic E layer. So the sporadic E layer is natural. The fact that the radar is seeing it is because uh, you know, thermoparametric instability excited by the heater was present. And so it allowed us to see something that we wouldn't have been able to see otherwise. And it allowed me to see that the kind of phenomena we've been looking at it at middle latitudes was also occurring here in the suborbital zone. And that's critical because there are different theories about why these things occur, and most of them wouldn't work in the suborbital zone because they just don't work where the field lines are nearly vertical. Um, interestingly enough, uh, for aficionados of gyro harmonics, uh, these lines are the places where we crossed over the third gyro harmonic, and so uh, the backscatter intensity really dropped substantially when we cropped across from below to above the third gyro harmonic frequency. It's an interesting fact, and uh, we were only able to do it this one time when we had um, densities that were high enough to get us into this, this regime of the third gyro harmonic. So um, I have a movie, and I want to show, I hope I'm going to be able to show you this. I hope it's going to work. And I just want to show you what, uh, over the course of time, how this evolved. So if it doesn't work, then I'm, that's too bad. No, nope, it doesn't work. I'd like to show you later. Anyway, bummer. Um, the figure just the, the movie file just isn't on the computer. But anyway, I can tell you. So this is over the uh, over the course of time. What you see is uh, these striations, these uh, northwest to southeast striation propagating through the field of view, and uh, you can only see them where HARP is heating because if HARP isn't heating, you don't have anything to scatter off of. But these things are propagating through the field of view. They're wave-like. They have periods of about 10 minutes or so, phase speeds of about 50 meters per second. And we see this at middle latitudes all the time. They're structured sporadic e layers. Our hypothesis is that they're there because of neutral dynamic instability, KH instability, that takes uh, background sporadic e layers and turns them into rolls. And then the rolls sort of propagate along uh, with, the, with the background mean flow. And on uh, this occasion, we were able to see them at you know, a, a, a suborbital latitudes because HARP was sitting there like a flashlight, uh, you know, lighting them up. And that told us, it allowed us to sort between the candidate mechanisms for why they're there. We've been studying these things in the Caribbean forever. There were different candidate mechanisms for why they're there. Some of them would just simply not work with magnetic field lines that, that are close to vertical like they are here. And so we could throw those out. And it left us with uh, you know, our favorite candidate mechanism, which is this is telltale of neutral dynamic instability. You know, gravity waves are sort of crashing through here, generating really, really strong uh, shear flows, and the, and the shear flows are dynamically unstable. So bang. You know, I, I, I came here to do harp things and ended up resolving a problem we've been looking at in the Caribbean for, for decades. So that's my story. Uh, we can use the anospheric modifications to study otherwise elusive phenomena, including uh, natural and artificial uh, plasma instabilities uh, associated with fiddle line irregularity backscatter, electron acceleration and secondary ionization use, using optical spectrometry, neutral density and winds in the ignorosphere, uh, the region of space that you can't really study by other techniques, but you can study it with API. And it turns out uh, daytime suborbital sporadic E layers, if you're lucky. So that's my story, and I'm sticking to it.
and I'd be happy to take any questions you have. Yeah. And you ramp up. Did you ever do that? Yeah. yeah, we did do that. Yeah, we, in the early days, we would ramp up and ramp down, but the ramp up became more interesting, so we did more of that. So when you ramp down, it's different. There is hysteresis, and essentially, we ramp down to just about the smallest power. We, we, we never were able to generate small enough power that the irregularities went away. And we kept trying, then we changed the experiment, say, oh, no, darn, too high, let's go even smaller. Oh, no, darn, they're still on, we can't get rid of them. So uh, once you exceed threshold, uh, it's, it's essentially permanent. The waves get trapped, that's why. Wave trapping occurs, and then they never go away. I also think that the artificial ionization creation has hysteresis. It's really hard, you know, you ramp up the power, and then it all of a sudden takes off, and then you ramp down the power, and the, and the plasma cloud would stick around because we see that in the laboratory. Mm -hmm. We haven't done it that much in the, uh, with HARP, and that's something we should do in the future, is you, know, you, you generate a plasma cloud, and then, and then do you, how much can you back off to, to actually sustain it? Yeah, it'd be interesting. I imagine self-focusing contributes to that, but um, yeah, it's not, not too surprising. Well, it's also the breakdown process. You don't have any electrons, and then you break it mm -hmm. down, and then, then you have seed electrons. Yeah, seed electrons for the next time around, yeah. Second to last, I'll just make this quick. I just want to thank, I just want to thank uh, Dr. Sfrega and, and his team for hosting this, this all-day event. There's been a lot of information exchanged. Um, ionospheric heaters, uh, active experiment, places are strange beasts. Uh, the U.S. has two of them, and, and there's a lot of things you can do with them. I think you got a hint of that this afternoon. Um, you can turn the overhead ionosphere into a laboratory, and you can do experiments. You can poke it. And, and watch how it re responds, like plucking a guitar string. Uh, a, lo a lot of interest. Um, the ionosphere is very important for a lot of facilities, a, lo a lot of applications like communication, GPS, navigation. Uh, the world is changing, and these facilities uh, may have increasing strategic importance. It's great that the U.S. has two, one at low latitudes where the magnetic field is mostly horizontal, and one at high latitudes where the magnetic field is mostly vertical. That, that makes a big difference. The physics is different and, and, and uh, allows you to do lots of different kinds of experiments. Uh, th these facilities are, are important. Uh, you can do a lot of things that, and get a lot of understanding of what's happening in the upper atmosphere that you can't any other way. Uh, we're looking for ideas of how to sustain these facilities in the future and, and to, uh, to use more of that. So I really appreciate Woodrow Wilson Center and Mike and the Polar, Polar Institute for hosting us, and, and thank all of you for coming and participating. I just echo uh, Bob's comments about thanking you all for coming and participating. Uh, Bob, thank you for, for allowing us to, uh, to have this kind of a program. So some have asked, just to wrap up, why the Wilson Center has conducted a, a morning session with experts on this particular issue and then why we do something public. And it's, it's simply uh, this, is that <clears throat> this, is, this is the nexus between science, research, and policy. And we look at policy implications. And so when I think about the assets that you just heard about and what they can do, what they have done, what we would like them to do. To me, these have policy implications for the United States and our international partners. So we look at both domestic policy and international policy. And to me, uh, from, from just an interest perspective, I'm compelled to say that these facilities like the one in Arecibo and the one in, in Alaska are really national treasures that need to be secured and funded outward. And as we know, there are other nations that have uh, interests and aspirations, would like to have facilities that we've already built, invested in, and are using. And so why would we give that up? I don't know. That's an easy policy answer. But there are also these science research policy implications that we will continue to follow. And as you can tell, we are proponents of facilities like this for a lot of different reasons. But I think we heard everything today from basic research, uh, regardless of the bathroom analogies, which we'll, we'll always come back to, uh, to, to, to listening to what's above but also thinking about implications for national security, basic research, applied research, and research conducted for things we do not yet know we need. What does the future hold? I think someone earlier talked about different kind of weapons systems that 10 or 20 years ago we did not think would be 
part of our narrative. Well, they're not only part of our narrative now, they're part of our world. And so we have two of these world-class facilities in our country. And to me, that is a signal central issue for our U.S. policy going forward, whether it's in the Arctic, the Antarctic, in low latitudes, high latitudes. Simply, this is a wonderful policy issue for us to tease out. And Bob, I would hope that you and your colleagues will come back and we'll continue discussions like this about this particular issue, but also we will continue this narrative that we've built here about Arctic research in the national interest, but also research in the nation's interest. So again, I thank you all for coming, and I hope today was fruitful. Thank you.